Welcome to the Two Month Review, the weekly podcast brought to you by Open Letter and 3%, in which we take one giant book, break it down bit by bit, section by section, talk about it, analyze it, have fun, discuss it, make jokes, do things related to books and reading. This season, I'm Chad Post from Open Letter Books. This season, we're reading Otter Arter by Vladimir Nabokov. And I'm joined as always by Brian Wood, author of Joy Time Killbox. You sound absolutely distracted and tired and exhausted in that introduction. What happened to the- That's, what that's the most the introduction you've given. <laughs> I'm like so peppy. Uh, <laughs> like this is like the opposite of Riverdale. Um, the, uh, like what happened to our, what happened to our landslide narrative? <laughs> I can tell you exactly what happened. We make fun of these two places on the show over and over and over again. And this is karma coming back to us. This is what happens when Ohio and Florida get to decide anything. Yeah, fuck Ohio and Florida, fuck <laughs> college, fuck all those middle states like the Dakotas, and then Iowa, fuck Iowa too. When when Arizona is the one that comes through, yeah, that's when you know, wow, this is a weird, things are weird. So <laughs> You're so lucky. I'm at the office and I was like, can I bring whiskey to the office? And I was like, probably not. <laughs> 100 proof. I have 100 and 115 proof. I'm going to start with 100 proof. I'm going to go up from there. <laughs> I, to, I need to go to the, the, the grocery store that I'm going to just start. Drinking. This isn't going to end for weeks, though. No, oh, I know. I, I, didn't we literally play one time? We did a bit where we played Florida, Ohio, yeah. Florida, where we had to guess where the, where the idiotic male behavior was coming out of. <laughs> it was so hard to pick. It's really hard. Like if it involved frozen iguanas and snakes, like oh, that's probably Florida. And it's like no, that, <laughs> that was in that was in Ohio too. Apparently, <laughs> if it's mess, yeah. it's like oh man, that's kind of both of them. Gosh. I, just, I just saw this great tweet that I retweeted. That was on. I wonder how that woman from Ducks Newburyport is doing today. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, not enough, there are not enough tart. There are not enough, not enough uh, apple tarts that you can make. Uh, bake your way out of this nonsense. Nope, you can bake and bake. And I is, did see though during the pandemic. You can bake and bake, and it will be okay. The, but I did see during the pandemic, there was a mountain lion that was that, that was uh, being predatory towards kids, like in San Francisco and stuff with the fires. Like they're all coming into the cities to eat children, apparently. <laughs> so, yeah, life is imitating art. And, yeah. Yeah, and I, I, I feel like you ever see that scene in a movie? It's it's almost always a war movie where our our plucky hero is uh, getting ready to like he's he's battle hardened and he's ready to finish his first tour, and then like the captain comes in. We got new orders. We're all here for the next tour. And there's just like that that long empty stare, and the face hollows out. And the cigarette is just limping in the mouth. And they're not bothering to ash, and the smoke is wisping, and you see the helicopters in the background, and they're stare. That's what I kind of feel like right now. Like, am I yeah. going to do a second tour of duty? Oh, oh. No. like it's just that empty. That's what it felt like as I saw all those. <laughs> it's like this is the exact same thing that happened last election. All the same mistakes, the same mistake of a candidate, the same. Like it was like lockstep. Like, oh, let's put all our chips on Florida, and like Florida just crushes it for 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 everything red. And it's like, oh, this is not good. I, not I, I, I truly believe that he well, he won Wisconsin. He'll win enough to like Biden will win enough to be declared the winner, and then but, there will be a fourteen weeks of court cases and Supreme Court rulings that will end like in like a day before the inauguration. Uh, but wait, like. Just to, like the last bit of this, because we should talk about something else, obviously. But, like, but I, I I already heard him, the president say he won. So, I mean, it's kind of over, right? I mean, you can stop counting. I mean, I finished the book. <laughs> <laughs> these other pages are like illegal pages. I don't know what these pages are doing, but they're just trying to, they're scraping them up. Just scraping them up. Won, so we should just stop and like let them win. Like that's the way things work. Yeah. Yeah. Why not? No. Be, be nice. He seems fragile, you know? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> he's not really a no means no kind of guy, so. 
<laughs> why, why, why would he say stop? Should we stop? I don't know. <laughs> I watched the I watched the South Park pandemic special last night instead of uh, MSNBC because it was tripping me out. And uh, that is funny as shit. <laughs> and like and like the bit where where Trump is telling you how to like get out of trouble. He's like, oh, all you do is oh, maybe this was the episode right before. But either way, they have, they call Trump and he's like, what you do is they accuse you of something, you deny it, you turn it back around on them and pretend you're the victim. <laughs> he's like, it's really easy. <laughs> Perfect. Yeah. Exactly. So, hey, so we, finished, we finished section two. We finished part two, which got really buzzing. We did chapter seven through 11, which is the last like 50 pages of part two. And this really kind of takes off. It was extremely, I found this part to be extremely cinematic, if that makes sense. Ironic that you said that. So I thought that it was as cinematic as well, but I think that I, what I was reading it as was a commentary on the relationship between cinema and, and writing and like the and art as like representation in both terms of memory, in terms of artistic value for like writing and for like the filmic sort of qualities and, and capitalist qualities of that. Well, we'd be jumping ahead to get to it, but I think it's a, a good point to just, you know, talk about it out of order. But um, mm -hmm. I think, um, Nabokov really does tip his hand on how he feels about cinema. Yeah. With, with how hilarious uh, Ada's pursuits are and how frivolous <laughs> and how like just wishy-washy and ridiculous it is. Like it's so, it's so kind of, yeah, trite and <laughs> like th there's the jokes about she was supposed to be the fourth sister, but they cut her out of the film so much. They might as well call it three sisters. <laughs> Or when Van is like, hey, you're in the movie. There's your elbow. Yeah. <laughs> like all of her scenes got cut. Already. Yeah. I love that it's Chekhov's three sisters, but like four sisters until they just re they can revive yeah. it. Three sisters, yeah. <laughs> Super you're not, fun. You're not in it. You're not in it. Yeah, I had a really good time reading this section, especially because it does like, the ending does have like some shit go down. Super melodramatic, right? Super melodramatic, but also super funny in like a in like an eighty screwball comedy way. Sure. In a bit, like uh, we'll get to that, but like yeah, there's like a little eighty screwball comedy in it that's almost cinematic as well. Sort of like Michael J. Fox, The Secret of My Success. Where you're that's, trying... what, yeah. that's what I was thinking. Of. Really? <laughs> <laughs> wow. All right. I think I think Michael J. Fox is like sort of like the uh, the spirit animal of two month review because we've used so many of his like shitty movie songs on here from the Fox season. <laughs> like, yeah, we did the that chicka chicka song right? yeah. from Secret of My Su Secret of My Success. It's in Ferris Bueller's Day Off, right? Which is okay. it's also in Ferris Bueller's Day Off, I think. Oh yeah, I think so. That whole ending um, part. It's like, you know, one of those eighties, late eighties, early nineties songs that just shows up and you're like, I don't know what this, this song doesn't exist outside of these movies. Yeah. You would never hear it on the radio. Be like, Oh yeah, that totally makes sense that you would play this, uh, ch -ch 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 bump, bump, bump song ever. Yeah. So I don't know what to make of this part just yet, because again, without knowing the book as a whole, like to me, it, it bifurcated isn't the right word, but it feels like it's patched together. And there's like these different modes that it goes through. Yeah, I was trying to think if like part one was like artists as like the, um, I forgot to look back at where exactly part one ended, but like mm -hmm. one is artists as like the Eden and then part two is like the downfall. Yeah. Well, and yeah, there's, it's it's getting more and more heavy handed with the Eden. Like now it's like actually saying yeah. Eden and the branch of Eden and like they're really... <laughs> Um, but, but you do see, um, well, I guess before I get to that, like, but yeah, like I, it was more, I don't know, kind of like pastel and, and rose colored lenses, kind of a, kind of a dreamy beginning. And then after, um, they start having incest, it gets a little kind of maybe not grittier necessarily, but like the, the, the bowl of fruit starts to decay a little bit. Right. And we what what was what was shown to us so in such exuberance and beauty is really like, no, this, this is disgusting. Yeah, this and, is and it feels really disgusting. And then it kind of switched to where it started to become more sci fi ish. Right. Yeah. And then here, this section is feeling very cinematic. 
to me. So I, I don't know what the different kind of modes and feelings necessarily, what it, what it builds to as a whole, because I haven't got to the end yet, but I am noticing like these different kind of changes and shifts um, mm -hmm. as we're reading it. And maybe that's why this one read really fast and because it just felt very kind of, not Hollywood, but that cinematic realism as you're reading it. It was much more propulsive than the earlier section. Yeah. Like, and yeah, and I'm not, Sure, why? Because like the first chapter, chapter seven is not. Chapter seven is kind of the opposite of that. Yeah, that I mean you get you get like the club, you get the club scene, right? Where they're they're going out and the, the soiree and the drinking, and then you have the menage a trois, and then you have the the damsel running away. Um, and then like so you're you're getting all of this kind of like yeah, like the the, the sins and the repercussions of the sins. But then there's that weird whole part with that we'll get to with like the, talking about cinema, and then obviously the the big kind of um, crescendo would be the father discovering the secret, it's like dun dun dun, yeah. right? Being like, "Hey guys, you're yeah. related." Yeah. And they're like, "Duh, duh, fucking ah!" Like we've been no we've known that for a while. So yeah, so let's start at seven because this and this is one where like um, chapter seven is the first one we went through today, and it's basically all based around Kim Boharnay. Um, a comes with a bunch of pictures of like events involving like Ada and Vaughn and like their 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 uh their trips to, to trips to the bone zone and they uh and so he has all these pictures of like all this stuff and like essentially like blackmails Ada for a thousand dollars whatever currency is in this magical world um a thousand of them and so they kind of look through them too and are looking through the different different photos and Vaughn's like you're so dumb now like he's not gonna like this isn't this thousand dollars is gonna take care of it. There's gonna be lots more. There's got to be um, like various negatives yeah. missing. Like this isn't this is not like this is not safe. Like this isn't gonna keep him keep us out of trouble. That's what I never got about um, like film noir, where they have the detective or the or the, it's always the PI that has the photos. Yeah, and they do that kind of like CD. Um, I'll give you, I'll give you the photos for the money. Like, and I want the negatives too. Like that, there's that whole cliche, right? But like, if you have the negatives, you can make copies. So I don't understand, like, how do they know they have all of them? It doesn't make any sense to me at all. Like, yeah, how, it really doesn't. It's still okay. I mean, you just always hang it over their head. Like, hey, I still have them. So I want another 500 bucks. Like, exactly. Months later or whatever. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> It's like uh, they everyone should do it like they do on that TV show Cheaters, where they videotape and instead of like having the pictures to show, they go and show the person the videotape of them cheating on their spouse. <laughs> have you seen this show? It's amazing. No, I have not seen Cheaters. <laughs> One of the funniest TV shows I've ever seen. The guy who runs it, so like he's a private detective, and they get hired to like see if uh, like your spouse is cheating on you, and um and. And in the show, they always are right. Like, there's no, there's no false positives in this. So they go and they go and find them. They always videotape them, and then they have a confrontation scene in which the aggrieved party comes with him. They confront the cheating party and show them videotapes of all their bad actions. And that person flips out. And in one of the episodes, the host got stabbed. <laughs> it happens, man. <laughs> it's like, don't... I, I have even if I wanted to cheat, I have no opportunity to because I have a five-year-old daughter that stays with me all the time and tells on me for everything, every little thing. Like, hey, daddy didn't fold the towels the way you like. <laughs> Shut up, man. I gave you ice cream. Yeah, so if I'm gonna be a cheater, I'd have to like take her to a babysitter. Like, th there's no way I'm getting around any of it. Like, you cheat with a babysitter. <laughs> yeah, dad took her to a babysitter so he could go cheat on you. Like, that would be the first thing where you go pick up mom from work. That's the first thing she would say. <laughs> <laughs> and then I'd stab myself. Forget the host. <laughs> just before, you, before any of you get a chance to do it, I'll just do it to myself. I'm good. <laughs> no worries, man. I've got this. So this is one part where I started thinking about that how there's a relationship here between like the book versus the or memory versus the film. And the book versus the film, because like this is like a concrete representation and is very cinematic or like picture us. Like the way that it describes each of their scenes is described as like, so for example, the first item in the evil series had projected one of Vaughn's initial impressions of artist manner at an angle that differed from that of his own recollection. Its area lay between the shadow of the caliche darkening on the gravel 
and the white step of a pillared porch shining in the sun. Marina, with one arm still in the sleeve of the dust coat, which a footman, Price, was helping her to remove, stood brandishing her free arm in a theatrical gesture of welcome. While Ada in her black hockey blazer, uh, blah, 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 belonging really to Banda, spilled her hair over her bare knees as she flexed them and flipped back with her flowers to check his nervous sparks. Like, it's a very specific, like, boom, 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 like Nouveau Roman sort of, like, images of where these things are. Yeah. But like, that event, we have already read. Like, we read that in Vaughn's description of it from a different perspective as he wrote it at the age of 90, recalling what he did back at that point in time. Yeah. Um, and so this, this like, sort of, like, uh, the fact that it's a blackmailer, that it's, like, an untrustworthy blackmailer, that it's, like, these these images are reduced. This whole book that we've read, this whole family chronicle has been reduced to, like, a series of photographs of these events is, like, is kind of, like, the... um like the Nabokov sort of like making fun of the kitschy stuff too. And of like the, the concrete simplicity of everything. It's kind of brilliant if you like, well, not kind of, it is brilliant. Yeah. Because even like the parts where, where Vaughn's saying like, how did you even get this shot? Were you like laying prone with all of the camera equipment to get in there? Yeah. How do we not see you? Like, and it's, it's basically like saying like, when, when you're, when you're as a reader and you're suspending your disbelief, where is this camera, this mind camera, where is this coming from? Just like, who, who is this person watching us while we're doing what we're doing? Like, this, this is the person, right? It's, like, it's, it's kind of puncturing the fourth wall, this, this section. Yeah. Was this guy, was Kim Beauharnais an actual character before this moment? Um, you could say yes, you could say no, I agree with I don't you. I remember. I know it's, the Kim is short for something else it says later but um yeah i don't remember but yeah like when you bring that up this idea of of memory and reality and, and cinema and film like it's all throughout this this part that we read and yeah it's quite brilliant the way it plays with it and their memories there yeah the specific part that i marked related to that too is on 406 where um I was like, guess she's like, Von, no more, no more fighting. It's just love now. Don't destroy this person. Like, we've just got to be okay. It's okay. Blah blah blah. And then um, she says, "You'll not slaughter him. He is subnormal. He is perhaps blackmailerish, but in his sordidity, there is an oof, visceral moan of crippled art." Furthermore, this page is the only really naughty one. And let's not forget that a copperhead of eight was also ambushed in the brush. And he says, "Art my foot." Her foot. This is the hearse of ours. A toilet roll of the carte du tendre. I'm butchering all this. I'm sorry you showed it to me. That ape has vulgarized our own mind pictures. I will either horsewhip his eyes out or redeem our childhood by making a book of it. Artists, a family chronicle. Which obviously is the thing that happens, but it's like either violence towards that thing or like because the, the images, the mind images have been yeah. denigrated through this like crass representation. The photography is like the crass version of of art yeah it shows like the the everything and it's sorted in most true nature without the the flourishes and the the other parts that make something beautiful yeah even if it's incest so like kind of an aside and and maybe it'll be of interest to some some of the viewers but when i'm when i'm teaching beginning writing and especially for fiction um i always go back to cinematic realism mm -hmm. um and it's to me like for reading, it's not. I'm not as interested in cinematic cinematic realism because yeah. you know I, I like things that are like fractured or weird or fun or whatever. But for the most part, that's how we. I mean, the first guy, the guy that invented film and shots, they asked him where, like, where did you come up with the ideas? And he's like, oh, Charles Dickens. Like every shot that I do is from Charles Dickens. Like that's panning, moving up and down, that kind of stuff, right? Yeah. Um, but I always take people back to cinematic realism. And I try to like say, if this was a movie, can you imagine like if we're just flashing back and forth and moving all over the place, how chaotic that would be for a reader to try to try to picture that and to glide through the scene. But it makes more sense if you do kind of maybe a, you know, you're further away and you slowly pan in. And then when you get really close to somebody, then you can kind of do this close back and forth between the two people. It's like, it glides you in nice and easy. And I like right here how he's kind of like, like this is a weird. It's a, it's like I don't know. I don't know. I don't know how comfortable he is with quote unquote cinematic realism, like that old way of writing books, right? Where you have to have people picture. I feel like he's kind of 
puncturing some holes and playing with that here a little bit. This is this is weird because I don't I don't think I noticed this until you said that. But 407, 408, and 409 are almost all just uh, dialogue, and I don't think that happens right. very often. And he's very anti dialogue. Yeah, and the way that Rodrigo is too. Well, he'll, he'll get over it at some point and learn how powerful speak speeches but you know, whatever. hi rodrigo um <laughs> <laughs> it's true no, but yeah this was this is a like because i know he's very um nabokov was very kind of harsh on the use of dialogue the way it's all you know maybe it was like a shot at hemingway or steinbeck or something i don't know like that real simplistic modernist writing of using dialogue but yeah but yeah, there is a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of dialogue in this section as well. I was surprised at that. Me too. I really like, I really like the ending part where it has like the last paragraph that isn't in dialogue, where it's talking about um, how all the the romantically inclined handmaids who readings had consisted of Guendevere and Clara Mervago, which seems to be like Guinevere and Doctor Shivago, adored yeah. John, adored Ada, adored artists as ardors and arbors. Their swains plucking ballads on their seven strings, the Russian lyres under the race most in bloom or in old rose gardens added freshly composed lines naive la lackadaisically but heartfelt to cyclical folk songs eccentric police officers grew enamored with the glamour of incest is one of my favorite lines but it's like it's like as if like the people so the the there's these photographs that, that they're blackmailing over but that the people in the town knew were seeing this and that it was like that they were into it in a way that it was like their romantic edge of it, including the eccentric police officers who grew enamored with the glamour of incest. No, and we, we've joked about that too, where like every quote unquote chambermaid or, you know, gardener knows this is going on, but these high flutin, you know, people of power and prestige that have, you know, a, a powerful last name are oblivious, yeah. apparently are oblivious to it, um, as we find out later. Yeah. Like surprisingly, though. So. Yeah, I, I thought for sure like Demon was on the up and up a little bit about it, but apparently not. not. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, he really draws the line. I guess incest is like that's where you draw the line. <laughs> <laughs> Even though he was like, and there was a hint of that last week that he was like attempting to seduce his daughter. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Ugh, okay, let's go to eight, chapter eight. Which which one is this? Is the one that had the um what you're talking about of where they go out and have their uh, outdoor, um, like, uh, uh, sorry, they go to the restaurant and they have their dinner, their mm -hmm. fancy dinner and their fancy thing with Lucette, Ada, and Vaughn, and they end up in like a menage a trois, kind of? Sort of, kind of. They get tanked. Yeah, they get tanked. <laughs> it's like 15-year-olds uh, or whatever they are. Isn't Vaughn trying to exploit... Um, Colette's desires for him to learn about who this betrothed person is, right? He wants to find out about the Vinelander person. Yeah, which which every time I type that or say it, like Vinelander just sounds like like something from like a bad Ben Stiller movie. Yeah. Yeah. Is yeah. that the original name for like for, for like Leif Erikson when they went to the New World, like Newfoundland and whatnot? They called it Vineland because of the wild grapes that were oh. in the New World, America. That makes sense. Yeah. The, so yeah, so this is the one where like he knows that that Ada is engaged, but doesn't know to whom, and wants to get that out of Lucette. And as part of that, they go to like this crazy fancy restaurant where they're like the three of them are like together, you know, acting like very uh, whatever. And I wrote on the top, this is like Dynasty or the lives of the rich and famous who are perverse. <laughs> Yeah, it's keeping with Kardashians, basically. Yeah, yeah. It's like, let's go to this fancy place. And they're like, we can do whatever we want. And like, people kind of watch them, but they're like outside of time in a weird way. Outside of judgment. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. That was a that was an interesting one. I also was confused a bit. And I have a question for you. Well, I've, there's one part that I really like, but I did have a question in terms of... Um, so... At this point, has Vaughn and Lucette have not had sex? I don't think so. I don't either. That's what I got this time. I thought they had before, but Lucette's had sex with Ada because that, that was like from last yeah. week and that's talked about here. And Ada's yeah. had sex with um, with Vaughn and he wants to have sex with Lucette to make this like a triangle of things. 
And I realize as I say that, or and as I wrote it yesterday, that that's part of like the A and B shape. There's something, there's something there to, to, I'm sure someone's written about this and when we get to the end, we'll find it. But there's something about the, the shape and the symbolic shape of all their names related to this in terms of their connections and non-connections of a V and an A, but also that ah sound that shows up throughout. It's in Nabokov, it's in Vladimir, it's in Ada, it's in Von, mm -hmm. it's in Artis, it's in Arbor. Like, I feel like that sound repeats throughout here as like some sort of like, I don't know, like not tone poem, but like it shows up so frequently and it's such, it always has like an emphasis placed on it. That I'm curious as to like what, what the, the what, what that might mean. Is it just a, a is it just a sound thing? Is it just like a pronunciation thing? Uh, Maybe like, I'm, again, I'm not a linguist or anything, but a lot of languages have the ah sound at the beginning of their alphabet, right? And mm -hmm. it's, it's the sound of pleasure, whether it's a meal, ah, or orgasm, ah, like it's of um, some sort of carnal pleasure being um, satiated is an ah sound. And that's kind of why I think a lot of them, are, it's believed or hypothesized that a lot start with ah, because it's that kind of like, like feed me or fulfill me is the right. ah, right? Yeah, um, but yeah, I don't know. And then what is the word they use for, because she ends up orgasming, right? And then freaks out and leaves. Did I catch that right? Yeah, I think you're right. Like it's, with most of Nabokov's sexuality in his books, it's really uncomfortable. And so maybe I'm trying to like forget it as I read it, because. Yeah, there were so many parts of this section where I was like, this is kind of hot. And then also like, like he does a wonderful trick where he writes with such exuberance and passion about things that are like that's the game he likes to play. I think. Mm -hmm. Obviously, you see, like the prime example is obviously um, Lolita, right? But um, I'm I'm going to write the greatest love story. I'm going to make it about um, you know pedophilia. <laughs> okay, yeah. a lot. Appreciate you. <laughs> Thanks a lot. And, and with this one, like, there was even that one line where he's like, he adds it up and he's like, yeah, I've slept with her probably a thousand times. She is my world. Yeah. Like he, he figures out, uh, I was her with her at this amount of time. We had some time apart and this amount of time I've been with her a thousand, like over a thousand times and she is my world. Like, like Vaughn actually loves, 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 loves her. Yeah. Um, but it's still terrible and awful and despicable. And yep. I think that's the game he likes to play is like the Terra anti Terra, the like uh, idealized love. And no, this is forbidden. You cannot do this like that, that kind of thing. Right. Yes. Yes, exactly. And somehow I feel like Lisette's kind of just kind of trapped in the middle of it in some way where she loves her sister and she loves Vaughn. Yeah. In different kind of ways, it seems, but also in the same kind of way at the same, yeah. same time. And she's like the fulcrum of this, like this awful teeter-totter that they have. Yeah, yeah. It is, yeah, it's really intense. This is, a, there's one great line in here that I thought was a Rodrigo line of tropes are the dreams of speech. Oh. It's like a very, but he does get so, in the plot wise, he does get Lucette to tell him that it's Vinelander is yeah. the, the person. So he does get that. Did you figure out um, what on 417, what the uh, code was? Oh, I didn't look it up. No. I couldn't no. find like anyone who had done it for me and I didn't take the time to do it last uh, night. Uh, that one? Yeah. No. And, uh, um, but this is also where like suddenly you get the the movie stuff starts coming in as well and like 419 mm -hmm. uh, starts to become very movie-esque in terms of like uh the descriptions and that's what i thought you were talking about earlier when you're talking about the cinematic aspect of it yeah absolutely the top sheet in the art and quilts are tumbled at the footboard list south of the island where the newly landed eye being like the camera starts on its northern trip 
Up the younger Mrs. Veen's pried open legs, a dewdrop on russet moss eventually finds a stylistic response in the aquamarine tear on her flaming cheekbone. Another trip from the port to the interior reveals the central girl's long white left thigh. We visit souvenir stalls, Ada's red lacquered talons, which lead a man's reasonably recalcitrant, pardonably yielding wrists out of the dim east to the bright russet west and the sparkle of her diamond necklace, which for the nonce is the most valuable than the aquamarines on the other side of the novelty novel lane. So there, it does have like a much more um, uh, cinematic and like stage direction -y vibe. Yeah. Also, one of my favorite lines here was that, uh, was more aroused than is good for him or a certain type of tourist. Yeah, no, because um, it almost feels like he was directing, it's like snuff isn't the right word, but like it, it that earlier time of pornography, there was like like basic like cheese. Like, I think they called it cheesecake, right? Where it's just uh, topless, and then there was the more like kind of taboo or risque um, type of stuff that gets you in a lot of trouble. And I feel like he's it's like seeing like he's um, playing with how to direct that um, with this with this taboo love affair. Yeah. Um, but yeah. yeah. I love the, the, the great synesthesia at the bottom too. Sounds have colors and colors have smells. No, go be like the way he connects that. Like I, I thought this was um, perfect. Like it perfectly sums up what this book is with how interesting, thought provoking, beautiful and nasty all at the same time um, is what reading this book has been like for me. Sounds have colors. A uh, very last line on 419 sounds have colors colors have smells the fire of lucette's amber runs through the night of Ada's odor and ardor and stops the threshold of van's lavender goat 10 eager evil loving long fingers belonging to two different young demons caress their helpless bed pet Ada's loose black hair accidentally tickles the local curio she holds in her left fist, magnanimously demonstrating her acquisition, unsigned and unframed. Like, is, like the language is gorgeous and it's disgusting what it's describing. Um, and it's, it's it, it, but it's sensual at the same time. Like it reminds me of that poem, The Lotus Eaters. Oh yeah, yeah. Where it's, they're, they're, they're eating of the, of the, of the lotus and they're, they're like getting sleepy and there's all the S's and, the, and it's this beautiful language, but they're, they're being taken away from, you know, what their objective is that like, I feel like when you read this, it's such beautiful, wonderful, fantastic, vivid language mm -hmm. and it's disgusting. And again, that's the, the trick of Nabokov. Like, yeah, absolutely. That's this thing. <laughs> like, it's like you really are taking this girl, yeah. Pat, um, being part of that, yeah. Like, what a fantastic, delicious paragraph of something so abhorrent, right? Like, it's it's so uncomfortable, and that's what I, that seems like. That's what he likes to do is like with exuberance and passion and beauty, take you to the most uncomfortable places of human existence. It's like the old, I mean, it was written in the 60s too. And like that form of postmodernism, that that thread of it, of like the high and the low mixed together. Mm -hmm. the, art, the, the art and the porn, the the all that kind of stuff, like being mixed and not being just one or the other. Yeah. Um, and he's using, with high, he's using with like the highest of high society, right? Where a thousand dollars, it's not a big deal here. I'll, I'll pay it off. Not a big deal. Yeah. Yeah. Or when we see later with Demon's response of like, well, I'm not going to disinherit you. I'll curse you, right? Like, Yes, yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, with this one, so yeah, so they, they then split apart from Lucette. Um, but Ada's like, oh, yep, I'm up in the tower. And he's like, I'm on my way. Um, but there has this great Nabokovian line right in the middle. It's like peak Nabokov. Where um, he's talking to, they're, where they're like, Ada's like, you're breaking her heart to, because Lucette has like this huge crush on him. And he's like, he's like, you cried over my unseemly scar, but and this is my favorite line ever. But now life is going to be nothing but love and laughter and corn and cans. Yeah, what is the corn and cans? I don't know, but I fucking love it. 
Isn't that a baseball? Isn't that a baseball scout? Yeah. A can of corn is like is like a simply easy caught ball. But like, uh, yeah, I wouldn't think of that as like being what's being referenced here. But I love like the idea of like it's nothing but love and laughter and corn and cans. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so funny. Imagine like someone of his tastes and of his like upbringing, like in wealth and whatever, to come to America and be with like quote unquote simple folks. It must have been very amusing to yeah. see like casseroles. Yeah. Like, Baked potatoes, or you know, like little, like like little simple pleasures that you know normal people like you or I are. <laughs> and it's just like, oh, how interesting! A can of corn. <laughs> never thought, never thought you would like, can it like corn and put it into a can, huh? <laughs> Usually, you know, it's picnics with uh, caviar and truffled, <laughs> truffled pheasant, and yeah, blah blah blah. <laughs> Oh my god. Yeah, the yes, absolutely. And then the night night chapter nine to move along. Chapter nine is the one that I had that was the very much movie versus literature that we were alluding to earlier. Yes. This one is like fraught with that. I mean, it starts with the description of the movie that they're filming earlier that was based on um Mademoiselle La Lavier's whatever um book. Um, has become the young and the doomed. And this is, I just have to read this because this is brilliant. So she, her book had been Infants Maudits or whatever it was, like the young, uh, I forget what it was, the, the, they had another name for it earlier, like the horrible children, the something children, whatever. Yeah. Um, the doomed, right? Yeah. And so this is the description of her book. She had two adolescents and a French castle poison their widowed mother who had seduced a young neighbor, the lover of one of her twins. The author had made many concessions to the freedom of the times and the full, foul fancy of scriptwriters, but both she and the leading lady disavowed the final result of multiple tamperings with the plot that had now become the story of a murder in Arizona, the victim being a widower about to marry an alcoholic prostitute whom Marina, Marina quite sensibly refused to impersonate. Like those two plots have zero to do with one another. <laughs> so what's the quote unquote, before? what's the elevator pitch for that book? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, but I mean, it's kind of even confusing because it's the victim was a widower who's about to marry an alcoholic prostitute, so he's the one who gets m killed, murder in Arizona. Yeah, it's like not a, it's not anything. It's like a bad true crime. That's like, like the Wikipedia like, thing you sent me, where it was talking about Chuck <laughs> Norris went under hypnosis. One of the children said Chuck Norris was one of the people that had abused. Them. <laughs> it involved fire balloons. And <laughs> I read that last night and was like, this is the greatest thing ever. So it was the Mc not really. No, it's a bad thing. I take the bag. It's bad. But M the McMartin preschool trials that we're talking about a sexual abuse case from the 1980s in which like there are allegations that were made against someone. And then it just went haywire into like the, the satanic panic, like hypnosis and like sexual abuse. That's not possible um, sort of claims, including bizarre ac accusations, which, um, included that the children who were claiming at this school, at this preschool, that they were sexually abused, claimed that they saw witches fly, they traveled in a hot air balloon, and were taken through tunnels. When shown a series of photographs by Danny Davis, the lawyer, one child identified actor Chuck Norris as one of the abusers. <laughs> Some of the abuse was alleged to have occurred in secret tunnels beneath the school. Several of excavations turned up evidence of old buildings on the site and other debris from before the school was built, but no evidence of secret chambers. There were claims of orgies at car washes and airports, of children being flushed down toilets to secret rooms where they were abused and cleaned up and presented back to their parents. Like, this is the camera in Elm Street Part 7. Yeah, it's like such a wild thing. And I was, I, during that time, like almost the exact same time, I was in uh, uh, high school plays or sorry, um, over the summer, the like, summer plays while I was in junior high, led by a high school teacher, principal, who was accused, or principal, high school teacher who was accused of um, molesting like multiple kids during those plays. And it's never been clear whether that was like a thing that happened or if it was like one of these where it, like was like one thing that became like, oh yeah, everyone like, and the amount of people who like were part of this was like too big to have been part of it sort of thing. It's like capturing the Freedmen's moment. Yeah. I don't know why we got off on that, but yeah, that was like, yeah, that's, that's like the two. The but back on track with this whole cinematic thing, um, one of my favorite parts on this was on page 426 at the top of it. And to me, it, it just showed how much Ada has changed. Because uh -huh. when we first meet her, like she's on track to be like one of the like foremost botanists, right? 
like her understanding and uh, the way she talks about. Um, I knew insects. Or sorry, it was is it entomology? I forget what what. Yeah, she, it was, yeah. Just na like knowing about nature and knowing the names of things and like how lofty and impressive and crazy smart she is, and then she is seduced by Vaughn, and this is what she's turned into at this point in, on 426. At 14, Ada had firmly believed she would shoot in stardom, and the, or she would shoot to stardom, and there, with a grand bang, bang, break into prismatic tears of triumph. She studied at special schools, unsuccessful but gifted actress, as well as Stan Slavsky, no relation, not a stage name, um, gave her private lessons of drama, despair, hope. Her debut was a quiet little disaster. Her subsequent appearances were sincerely applauded only by close friends. <laughs> one's first love, she told them, is one's first standing ovation. And that is what makes great artists. <laughs> yep, she's gone a long way down. That's a, long, like, that's a giant spiral down from, from where she was that, that first summer they met an artist. Yeah. Yeah, this this is a tragic. absolutely, and this section does set up one of the big like Nabokovian um, sort of tropes. Where uh, at the bottom of four twenty six, I marked where in real life we are creatures of chance in an absolute void, unless we are unless we be artists ourselves naturally. And this is a very Nabokovian bit of like the if you can create like you're stuck at at you're like to the whims of fate or the whims of a chance that are that are happening. But if you're an artist, you can take control of that situation a little bit and create something out of it. And like that sets himself up against in this chapter of like the written word versus that cinema cinematic Hollywood tawdry version where she's no longer a sensitive, beautiful young woman that has all this promise, but is just like an actress to be used as a prop and discarded. Well, like you're cut out. Yeah, you're, you're, you're no longer a subject, you're an object at that point, yeah. right? Yeah. Because you're, you're through the lens and you're being viewed, right? And it's also about what kind of adoration you can garner. Absolutely. Yeah. It's very interesting. I, I, yeah, this is this section I thought I could go through another time and like sure. yeah. really pull shit out of because it has like a lot, there's a lot packed in here. Um, <laughs> I have to say that one of my favorite favorite uh, Nabokovian names of the day is uh, on four thirty Dangle Leaf, the ballet master <laughs> Dangle Leaf. <laughs> I don't know why that cracks me up, but it's like such... <laughs> Mr. There Dangle. Some, there was some racist name that he had in here too. Um, oh, really? I made a mess. It was, it was a it was a pun on something Asian, and it had a racist Asian name. Right? <laughs> I didn't mark it down. It's super distasteful, though. But yeah, I mean, he's playing with a lot of names and being very funny, um, for sure. But one of them was like, "Oh God, that's a little too far, there, buddy." Yeah. So here's the um. So here's specifically is the written word thing too. And four twenty five, for him, the written word existed only in its abstract purity and its unrepeatable appeal to an equally ideal mind. It belongs solely to its creator and could not be spoken or enacted by a mime, as Ada insisted, without letting the deadly stab of another's mind destroy the artist in the very lair of his art. A written play was intrinsically superior to the best performance of it, even if directed by the author himself. So that's that's sort of like where you're like, yeah, the anti, the anti-filmic, anti-production aspect of of the written word. Yeah, which is interesting. So yeah, so we get through that, and then we get to ten where this is the one where um, they get caught. Yep. Yep. So in this scene, they're banging in his in Cordula's apartment that he now owns, and they, like, have been sneaking around there. Like, I think Ada's supposed to be in Hollywood or out west somewhere. They have, like, Hollywood slash El Paso, because El Paso seems like a natural, you know, conduit to Hollywood. <laughs> sure. If you like, if you like yards that are made of stone, um, the, uh, the, the, so that, I think that that's where she's supposed to be, but instead she's in Manhattan hiding out with Vaughn and they're like sort of sneaking around and they don't want to get caught by anyone. And they see someone they actually know and sort of bluff their way through it and are hoping that she wouldn't tell demon if he shows up, but he's not supposed to show up until the end of March. 
or until March. And then he comes in the middle of February and pops in and is like total chance. Total chance. Everything is a chance. Because it right, he, he's only there because he he went in crazy fast because of Uncle Dan uh, falling ill, right? Yeah. He's gonna die. So he rushes to get there and then he sees like this really nice breakfast cart. He's like, oh, it's like something my son would do. Oh, I'll have a cup of coffee. I'll just follow this up or, or whatever. Like it's just. And he's like, is, is Bond still living here? He's like, yeah, he's been with this woman friend the whole time, um, this whole winter. And so, yes, yeah, so the demon goes in there all, all doped up too. Like yeah. that's not good that he's like. Oh, Cordula. <laughs> you got some Cordula. Nice. <laughs> like fucking lit. Go down. Rug. He's trying to get his dad out of there. Dad, go, leave. Just leave. <laughs> Hey, I'm gonna just sit a little bit longer here and talk. To <laughs> this is one of those funniest things. Sitcom, bosom buddies. We're back to bosom buddies again. Yeah. <laughs> or secret of my success, where someone's changing clothes and hiding and being something different. There, this is such. So this is the screwball comedy part to me. So that you get this coincidence, which is very much like you know the the coincidence of, of humor that comes with those kind of movies. And sure. then you get like how Dan dies is because he's obsessed with Bosch art, Rana Bosch's art and sees some detail and it drives him insane and he flees the house and like, you know, has an attack. And so Demon's explaining this and Demon's like hopped up on like shit loads of amount of Coke, has like a page and a half of just like rambling shit. And then suddenly it's like, was he was he perhaps under the influence of some bright Chilean drug? That torrent was simply unstoppable. A crazy spectrum, a talking palette. And he like goes on and on. And then he's like, Van's like, no, you can't come. You need to go. You need to get out of here. And he's like, Brr. and then like, of course, then Otto walks out of the out of the room. Cocaine is a hell of a drug. Cocaine is a hell of a drug. <laughs> yeah. And so they're, they're caught. Like maybe I'm reading into things too much. Was it just me or did it really when when Demon showed up and was in the rain and walking across the street and whatnot, it was so reminiscent of when the devil kills that first person in um Master Margarita. Oh yeah, you're right. The streetcar and the, that whole scene and the decapitation and yeah. how, how chance that was or whatever, how crazy it was. It yeah. felt very like eerily reminiscent of that setup as he was um, like kind of wave to the person but wasn't wearing the hat and like all the little like tiny details that create the grand thing to happen I felt like it was building up to that in this scene yeah yeah that's very true I hadn't thought about that it's absolutely true but I'm by no means a, a Russian lit person so I don't I'm gonna stay in my lane that's not that's not for me to say <laughs> yeah yeah it's uh I, I think that that counts, though. But yeah, I agree with you. I read a few Russian books, and they were both written by Tom Clancy. So, <laughs> oh, oh, man. Man. Oh, man. that's that's the best I got. <laughs> and, then we, that, and then we get to the last chapter where where he's like, "Guys, you know, when did this start?" And Von's like, "Oh, back in '84." And this is where that line was. Yeah. All in all, suppose I have had her about a thousand times. She is my whole life. Um, and then there's like this random, like sometime I'll tell you about the black Miller. Not now. And we get this whole long thing. And it's like demon as this is a moment where it's like demons, an assassin, like he and Vaughn are bad people. When shit doesn't go their way, they don't just like take it. They just go and annihilate that person. Like Vaughn fucks it up last, last part. Cause that's the end of part one is when he goes to kill those people mm -hmm. and gets stabbed or, and gets shot. Um, but uh, in this demon, like takes out, takes someone out, um, and like takes out other people. A reference there too. So he's like more of a, a, like even more criminal and more like demonic than just the than the than his name and just the general sex thing. But he's also been described like almost literally as like a black hat, twirling mustache monocle person. Like just shows up just like smoke and brimstone, right? Like just evil, like evil yeah. purpose. And again, it's that it's that weird trick that Namakov likes to do. You feel sorry for Demon when the bombshell hits and then and then Vaughn is sitting there stroking his finger on the desk, watching his father just fall apart before his eyes at what his son has become. Yeah. Like yeah. 
it may not be that impactful, but it, it's a moment where it's like, wow, the way he shows like how hollow his tanned face is and the, he starts crumbling in the tears and like, it's again, it's that wonderful trick of, Hey, here's this awful person and I'm going to humanize him for you. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. It was the exact opposite of how it was when they were at that dinner. Yeah. Yeah. Where, where it humanized. We, we talked about that where it humanized Vaughn the whole time. Like, yeah. Really felt sorry for Vaughn at that dinner where he showed up and now they show up again and you feel sorry for the father. So it's really, Again, I, I, an interesting trickery and playfulness by um, Nabokov here. And that's very Anna Karenina-like too, because that, that book works off this reversal constantly and that sort of back back and forth. I love the part where it's like, where Bond's like, dude, don't worry, dad, don't lose your temper. Nature as I formed you once has been kind to me. We can afford to be careless in every sense of the word because he's impotent and can't get her pregnant. And he's like, no, it's cool, man. Like, <laughs> Nothing's gonna happen, and then and then Demon's like, "I'm not concerned with semantics or semination," which that was a great line. Oh, yeah. He's like, "I can't disinherit you. I can't do enough, but like, I can curse you," and uh, and gets kicks him out, and and he leaves. Bond leaves. Yeah. Part three. Part three. Revenge of the Fifth. <laughs> yeah, I wonder. Part part three is much shorter. And part four and five are incredibly short. So like this all speeds up towards the end, it seems. Yeah. I, think, I, I wondered about that when we first started reading it, that each part is shorter than the last, the same way that like Book of Anna was, um, that, that that might create a sense of like an artificial sense of speed that that's the book's uh, tempo as well. Maybe I'm really excited to finish this book and I want to go back and read the first chapter again because I remember how insanely confusing yeah. orienting it was and knowing the whole story, I, I, next to positive, it's going to be a stroke of brilliance and I'm doing everything in my power not to go back and read it because I want to be surprised by it, by everything that's in there and coded in there, but yeah. I'm, not, I'm going to wait. I'm not going to do it, but yeah, that's, yeah, it's going to make total sense now. Yeah. Yeah. I have, I, my favorite, my favorite quote is on page 445 of this week. So I'll just go with this one right now. My favorite quote of the week is, Nothing happened, or perhaps everything happened, and his destiny simply forked at that instant, as it probably does sometimes at night, especially in a strange bed, at stages of great happiness or great desolation, when we happen to die in our sleep, but continue our normal existence with no perceptible break in the fake serialization on the following neatly prepared morning with a spurious past discreetly but firmly attached behind. This is all but like maybe things split. Yeah. He tries to shoot himself, but it doesn't work. And it's like maybe that moment, like he did die, but continues on and referencing it within the dreams. I really like it reminds me of um, the opening scene of slacker. Wow. Uh, uh, nice. 90s today. Well, no, we were 80s. We were doing 80s. We went to the yeah, 80s. Yeah. Remember those simple times when the right people won elections in the 90s and. Did they? Well. Michael. Michael Dukak, oh, that's 80, uh, 88. That's 88, never mind. Somewhere there's a, there's a Subaru Outback with, with no wheels, with weeds growing over it. It has a Michael Dukakis bumper sticker on it. You know, <laughs> <Right there. laughs> somewhere in Minneapolis. <laughs> I already yeah. read mine. It was on, uh, that one that's on 419 and mostly on page 420. About mm -hmm. the, Sounds have colors, colors have smells. The fire of Lucette's amber runs through the night. That, that whole was just wow. Yeah, that is a great line. A lot of great lines in here yeah. this week. So, um, yeah. next week we're doing chapters one through six, which is pages 447 through 501. Okay, got it. So, just over 50 pages again, um, and six chapters, and then we'll finish up chapter three, then do parts four and five. So we only have three weeks left of the book itself. Uh -huh. and bonus episode in which we read all everyone's uh, recommended criticism. So if you have any like uh, essays or articles or things about Ada that you think we should consider, please send them along. You can email me, um, which is easily easy to find. You can leave them as comments on the uh, post about this podcast on 3% or you could leave it on the YouTube, um, the YouTube video. 
uh, because I see all those comments too, because they all come through. So just send them, send them, do whatever. I have a couple articles so far and a chapter from a book, but I really don't know. I haven't done that much research. So if there's something that someone likes, please send it along if you think it'll be useful. So I don't have anything else to add, except I hope this thing, I hope by next week, all the election stuff is done and good. I'm moving. I'm moving somewhere where I can don't have to worry about this. I'm going to Puerto Rico. <laughs> oh, oh, and we still and New York still hasn't legalized weed. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Fuck this state. <laughs> Show